This presentation is called, What is the Phenotypic Gambit? So we're going to answer three questions. One, what is the phenotypic gambit? Two, how do human behavioral ecologists think about genes? And three, what is gene environment interactionism? So let's start with the question, what is a phenotype? Because if we're going to discuss the phenotypic gambit, we have to know what a phenotype is. And this is an opposition between what's called the genotype, that's the genetic basis of the attributes of an organism. And in the early 1960s, scientists working at the National Institute of Health figured out what's called the triplet code. And that triplet code then relates triplets in the bases of RNA to specific amino acids. So when you look up here, rather than seeing C-A-G-T, as you do when you're looking at DNA, you see C-A-G-U, and that's because in RNA, uracil replaces thymine as a nucleotide. But if we focus in there, you can see that there are specific amino acids. L-E-U stands for leucine. There's four bases of nucleotides, and that means there are 64 possible triplet combinations but there's only 20 amino acids that result, and that means that some of the amino acids have redundant triplets. And in the case of leucine, six different triplets all code for the same amino acid. But this is an excellent uh, example of our genotype because our bodies are basically made up of proteins that are simply strings of amino acids and those amino acids are coded for in our DNA through the triplet code. So the phenotype then is the physical or behavioral attributes of an organism. And what we're interested in is how the genotype is related to the phenotype. This termite cathedral, as it's called, is an interesting example of a phenotype or what's called an extended phenotype, and the idea that the modifications that living organisms make in their environments might also be considered part of their physical phenotype. Another way to think about the distinction between genotype and phenotype comes from Mendelian genetics. And most of you are familiar with this. It's called a Punit square. And what it does is takes two different alleles of the same gene, the big B and the little b, and works out the possible combinations. So if we look at that, we can see that a big B, big B, little b genotype, those are two different genotypes. So this uh, purple P uh, flower, this is uh, big B, big B. But this one is also purple, and it's big B, little b. So we get the same phenotype despite having a different genotype. And this is one of the origins of this distinction. And of course, the same thing would hold for leucine. The amino acid is the same, even though there are six different triplets that produce it. And each of those triplets is, in a sense, genetically distinct from the others because it's a different set of bases. So what is the phenotypic gambit? Well, it's a phrase that Alan Graffin introduced in 1984 in an essay called Modeling in Behavioral Ecology. And what was Graffin getting at with this phrase? Well, there's two meanings in that essay that he gives to the phenotypic gambit. And the first meaning is analyzing the cost and benefits of a behavior without understanding its genetic basis. 
And this takes us back to the distinction between proximate and ultimate causes and proximate and ultimate analyses. If we consider the genetic basis of behaviors to be a proximate cause, then what he's arguing here is we can focus just on the behavior and its outcomes without knowing about the genes that cause it. The second way he defines the phenotypic gambit is using the simplest possible genetic models when we're trying to model the evolution of a behavior in order to keep things simple. So one thing that we can drive from this, which critics have pointed out, is that evolutionary approaches to behavior generally black box genetics, or they've done so in the past. And the basic idea is that genes cause behaviors but the black box concerns how those genes influence or cause the behaviors. And indeed, in most cases, that simply isn't known, although things are changing very rapidly. So this raises a fundamental question. How do anthropologists who study behavior from an evolutionary perspective think about genes given that we know that we don't understand very much about how specific genes lead to specific adaptive behaviors. So there's two themes that we can draw on to understand how we think about genes in the study of human behavior. And the first theme is the use of very simple models. And an example of this that we looked at is Hamilton's rule. So in Thinking about how that might work, we imagine that there's a gene for altruistic sacrifice, and the rule then defines its viability. We don't actually know what the gene is or what the genes might be that would lead to that behavior, but we can model it nonetheless. The second theme is an awareness of the complexity of genetic causation that's been discovered by behavioral geneticists. And in relating this, we're going to discuss six things. One, what's the meaning of a polygenic trait? Two, what is pleiotropy? Three, what do we mean by gene-environment interactions? Four, what is a norm of reaction? Five, what is a facultative response? And six, uh, what is epigenetics about? And we'll run through these fairly quickly, um, but this should give you a sense of the complexity of genetic causation. So we'll start with the idea of a polygenic trait, and this is opposed to a Mendelian trait. A Mendelian trait is the product of just one gene. And an example of that is the color of the uh, flower in this Punet square. It's either purple or white, and there's only one gene that determines that. If that gene has two alleles, but one gene causes that difference in traits and minds us of a switch being turned on or off. A polygenic trait, on the other hand, is the product of two or more genes. And this is a chart, the distribution of stature uh, from a work early in the 20th century, presumably, in Scotland and Sardinia. But this starts to look more like what's called a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution. And generally, the more genes that you have affecting a trait, the more you're going to get this continuous pattern of variation rather than with a, as with a Mendelian trait where you get one character state or another. So what is a pleiotropic uh, gene? Well, this is when a single gene affects multiple phenotypic characters. So if we imagine that this would be related uh, somehow to altruism, it would get more complicated because the gene leading us to be altruistic might also affect some other seemingly unrelated character. And here's an example of this, something that's often discussed today in relation to pleiotropy is what's called antagonistic pleiotropy. And this is uh, the case when, so one genetic effect harms us and another benefits us. 
And this can occur particularly when the gene has these effects at different points in our life cycle. So if a pleiotropic gene benefits us when we're young, it will be selected for even though it harms us when we're old. Uh, third, uh, then what is gene environment interactionism? Well, this is the fundamental way that behavioral ecologists think about how genes might affect behavior. And I'm going to throw a series of quotes at you from John Alcock's Animal Behavior to underline this. So Alcock writes that the development of any attribute of any living multicellular organism is dependent on both genes and environment. On the one hand, he writes, no trait, not one, is genetic as opposed to environmental. And on the other hand, nor is any trait environmentally determined in the sense of developing without genetic input. So this is called the nature versus nurture uh, fallacy. It's a false opposition to think that we can sort out nature and nurture. And an excellent example of this is sex determination in the American alligator. So when the eggs are incubating, if the temperature is greater than 93 degrees, the alligator will develop into a male. But if the temperature is less than 86 degrees, it will develop into a female. If the temperature is between 86 and 93, you'll get a mix of males and females. And if we ask, well, is that environmental or genetically determined? It's obviously both. One way that we can make this point about the necessity of looking at both environment and genes is with what's called the square analogy. So imagine we have a square and we label one side of it environment and another side genes then asking whether a trait is genetically determined or the result of nurture is equivalent to asking which side of the square determines its area. And quite obviously, we cannot determine the area of the square without multiplying genes times environment. So the basic idea here is that you have to take into account both genes and environment to understand behaviors. And indeed, this has been called the core dogma of behavioral genetics. Uh, interesting person to read on this is Robert Sapolsky, who's a primatologist and a behavioral geneticist. A fourth concept that will allow us to think about the interaction of genes and environment is what's called a norm of reaction. So for a long time, geneticists have been aware that an organism that has the same genotype can develop differently in different environments, and that difference is what's called the norm of reaction. So this slide shows corn plants that are developing in a uniformly nutritious uh, solution, and they're growing relatively tall, whereas corn plants that are developing in a deficient nutrient solution are growing shorter, even though all of these plants are genetically clones of one another. So all of the differences that we see here are environmental, and the range of that variation across these different environments, that's the norm of reaction of a corn plant. So a fifth concept that similarly relates to gene-environment interactions is the concept of a facultative response and this refers to the ability of an organism to alter its phenotype in response to different environments. And here's a famous example of this. These are clownfish, and clownfish are protandrous. And what that means is that they can change their sex, and that they change their sex in response to their demography uh, based on the social environment. In a school of clownfish, most of them will be quite small and be non-breeders. And then you'll have one large female who will be the largest fish in the school and a large male. And that large male then and the large female, those will be the breeders. Well, if the female dies, it will be the large male who will turn into the next female. And that large male will alter its sex to female and then the largest of the non-breeders will then turn into the new male.
And that's a very remarkable facultative response. And this is also called phenotypic plasticity, the ability that we have to change our phenotype in response to our environment. So how could that possibly happen? Well, one possible line of explanation and another concept that shows the interaction of genes and environment is what's called epigenetics. And to understand this, we need to first go back to the central dogma of genetics in the 20th century. And that is that the line of causation flows from the gene to the protein. This is also called hard inheritance. And what it means is that if you want a puppies that don't have a tail, you can't get that by cutting off the tails of their parents. So modifications in the proteins don't lead to modifications in genetic expression. And that has been the central dogma of genetics. Epigenetics alters this pathway of causation. So in some cases, the environment can influence the action of regulatory genes. And those regulatory genes, in turn, can influence the activity by switching on and off coding genes. And the coding genes, of course, code for the proteins following that triplet code. So in this case, the causation can move from the environment to the protein. It still doesn't mean that you can cut off the tail of the parents and get puppies without tails, but it does show us that environment can influence how genes act. Now, epigenetics then is often explained in terms of differences in gene activation. And one way that we can understand this is by noting that every cell in your body has a full complement of nuclear DNA. So that's the case for every brain cell in your body and every liver cell in your body. So why is it then that brain cells differ from liver cells? Well, the idea is that different sections of DNA are activated in different kinds of cells. So to summarize here, when evolutionary anthropologists think about genes, there's two themes. First, there's the simple models that suggest that gene X causes behavior Y. And secondly, there's the fact that we're aware that that's far too simple and the causation is likely much more complex. The question is simply whether or not that simple model can predict and explain the behavior without understanding the complex causes. Thank you for listening.